from lunch, continuation, module five, we were talking chemical contaminants, and we uh, ended up with the fluoride. Fluoride being one that is both on your primary standards as well as your secondary standards uh, yeah. list for contaminants. How does it get into our drinking water again? If it's a groundwater system and it's just naturally occurring, again, water is a universal solvent, uh, so it, it, it is easily dissolved into the groundwater. Uh, also, discharge from fertilizer and aluminum factories it would be another potential way of getting into the water source. Um, and in some cases, some systems, because it's not naturally occurring, actually add it to their water source. So it's an additive. Another contaminant of concern uh, are the nitrates, nitrite. Uh, let's see, Tommy, can you remember why this is of some concern to us for Module 4? <laughs> well, it's, 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 a, it's a cute thing, and when I, what happens with the nitrate stuff, it uh, disrupts the oxygen to the blood cells, which can cause some serious health effects, especially in uh, like uh, infants six months and younger and elderly. Right. Now I give Pam and uh, Mont in order to answer that. Answer. Does, does it affect the elderly? Not well. Again, most of the time when you see these contaminants, it's usually the very young or very old or the compromised immune system. This one here, uh, according to research, mostly affect the very young. We're talking infants under the age of six months. Yeah. Their immune system had have not developed. Uh, to the point where it needs to be at that point. All right, so usage, nitrate, fertilizer. Um, and as Tommy so eloquently pointed out, blue baby syndrome is one that we're concerned with. Uh, as far as EPA standpoint, the maximum contaminant level goal is 10, as well as that limit is 10 milligrams per liter. Gets into our water source from runoff, from fertilizer, from leaking septic tanks. And you all asked the question earlier concerning uh, the chicken poop, so to speak. Uh, sewage, also from the erosion of natural deposit. And again, if you have underground storage facilities, tanks, and things like that, you are bound by the emergency planning and committed to right to know in order to report any releases on an annual basis. Other contaminants that we are of uh, concern uh, would be radium. Radionuclides are atoms with unstable nucleus, which in order to become more stable, they emit energy in the form of high rays or high speed particles, uh, which are of some concern. Uh, ultimately, it can disrupt the DNA function. Uh, major type of ionizing radiation, we have alpha particles, we have the beta, we have the Gamma rays. Quite a few people are concerned with those right here. And now that I'm doing all of this transferring back and forth and flying through the sky, I'm getting lots and lots of hits here. Now, 80% of exposure from radiation is actually from natural sources. 80%. A lot of people think, well, it's because. You know, companies in years past did all this illegal dumping, and that's the reason we're having issues. But a lot of this stuff is naturally occurring. Rock soils, cosmic radiation from space, radon gas. Only 20% is from man-made sources. So a much smaller component there. Uh, it's okay. 20%. We actually had a water well that we operated that had a problem uh, with radioactive deuterium radium, 226 and 228, and what they ended up having to do was abandoning that particular well. Sometimes you can look at blending with another source in order to reduce it, but they had to abandon it and actually uh, dig another well was ultimately what they did for uh, another source. So it can be something that is 
drastic. We had to go through the whole gamut of doing the uh, city meetings with people and things like that and with the community. Uh, we provided bottled water in the interim uh, so they would have a safe drinking water source there. Now EPA regulates the growth alpha emitters, the beta particles, uh, photons, uh, as well as the iridium-226, 228, these are combined. And as of 2000, uranium was added to this list. So you're looking at four of them, one, two, three, four, that we now are concerned with. Radium, uh, some of the uses, nuclear medicine for diagnostic treatment or research, and that also because it helps us to determine cures. Another uh, use would be killing cancer cells. Again, awesome uh, way of utilizing it, imaging. Uh, it produces steam, which turns the turbines to generate electric power. It's used in smoke detectors and also to kill pathogens and your food and to uh, kill insects also. However, the health effects from it could be an increase in cancer risk, uh, kidney problems. Now, the goal for any of these, uh, zero. That's the goal. That's what we would like to see. But again, there are maximum containment <coughs> level or some that is allowed there. And you can see what those limits are there on, uh, in your book, figure 5.12 or 5.1. Go back to that. 2000, there was a revision to the rule to include uranium. And again, naturally occurring trace amount uh, that's in the soil and rocks. Now, once you have discovered that you have an issue, um, with these entities and you are exceeding the maximum contaminant level, some of the things that you want to start looking at are the treatment options that are available to you to reduce them to the level, whereas again, we can provide a product that, it, that promotes health more or less, does not cause any health risks, and so some of the treatment options would be your activated aluminum beds um, here, it's good for arsenic, fluoride, uranium, as well as selenium. Uh, some of the operational issues and what you want to do is to look at all the available treatment options that are out there. Look at your scenario or your application and see whether or not it works with what you're trying to achieve. Is it economical? Can you get to the levels in which you need to get to? Um, some of the issues with the uh, activated aluminum would be pH, it's pH dependent. So that will be something you'll have to take into consideration given your situation. Um, another clogging, and as with other filters and things like that, how do we rectify that and that wash? So there's some maintenance involved here. And it must be regenerated, well, the same if you're looking at uh, activated part. So those are things that you have to make sure that you maintain your equipment as well as your um, media in order to be effective to remove what you need to remove. It is low cost and minimum oper operator's attention is required for that. Some of the things that you need to be concerned about if you go with this option, what are you going to do with the backwash water? Okay. Uh, rinse water, your acid, neutralization water. Can I just dump that in the nearest waterways? No, why not? Because then I could not like that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, there's a rule, there's a reg, even for that. You cannot discharge anything in the waterways of the state or the nations unless you have what? Permit. So again, you can't just go willy-nilly, oh, this is awesome for my situation, I need to get rid of all this extra stuff, and just put it in there. No, you have to go through the process of getting a permit and abiding by that permit. You may end up with concentrated levels of arsenic and radionuclides, so now that's another issue. 
Because now I have to start looking at not only having someone else to come take my leaves away, and I'm just processing it myself. So pre-treatment may be necessary before you dispose of it. One of the options may be a sanitary sewer, but yet again, most of your wastewater treatment facilities will have in place sanitary sewer use ordinance or industrial use ordinances that you will have to abide by that before you go and use their system. So either way you look at it, to have a permit to discharge it to the receiving screen or to abide by their rules and regs. In, uh, in other words, you may have to pre-treat yours before putting it into your collection system. And I exchange is another option. It is a physical chemical process, which I own to swap. Usually when you're doing this, chloride is one of the ones that is utilized. Um, and so in the salty water, but hey. Um, some of the um, technologies that are that this works well with would be getting rid of arsenic, uh, nitrate, uranium, and fluoride. So, it's one of the better treatment uh, technologies available for those particular contaminants there. It is uh, pH dependent, and most everything that we're doing, all of these various options would be pH dependent. In other words, they work well at a certain range. Uh, it's difficult to regenerate the resins if, uh, with a uranium exchange. If your total dissolved solids are greater than five milligrams per liter, it'll adversely affect the treatment performance. And pre-filtration is recommended if your source water turbidity is greater than three interviews, one three interviews. A little more operator skills are necessary to effectively operate the anacon exchange. And we have the same concern with our rates. Uh, what are you going to do with it? Okay. Pre-treatment of the spent brine may be necessary. Again, prior to disposal, you're going to have to abide by whatever industrial sewer use ordinance or sewer use ordinance that is in place. Other options, we have iron-based absorpt absorptive material. However, it's not considered one of the better practices or technologies that are available. But it can be effective for arsenic, radium, uranium, and epitome. Operational issues are similar, pH dependent. Also, you may have an accumulation of bacteria in the media during low flow or in hot weather. Um, breakthrough can occur when you're removing multiple contaminants, which now you end back up with the problem you had before you got started. So we'll have to weigh the pros and the cons. Mixed bed ion exchange is another treatment option. Uh, here we have anion as well as cation uh, exchange resins in one single unit. Um, and it is good for arsenic, radium, uranium, <coughs> sulfate, magnesium, and calcium. Similar operational issues as far as optimum uh, pH is in the high range. Your sulfate and uranium can displace arsenic from the resin, causing a spike of arsenic in the treated water. Breakthrough is a possibility also with this particular treatment method. And uh, alkalinity may be an issue, especially if you have no natural alkalinity in your water. And here again, uh, a little more higher operational skills are necessary. We have green sand filtration um, as a treatment op option also. Here we're using media to oxidize and absorb the contaminants. And it can work for our radium iron as well as manganese up to 10 parts per million. You see the operational issue, how iron to manganese ratio uh, or is a radium absorption on the filter. pH is another thing that um, is of concern and um, it can be cost effective and then the waste disposal also is of some concern as far as the sludge and supernatant from the filter that was. 
And then we have the treatment option that many people widely use, uh, both at wastewater as well as water facilities, oxidation, coagulation, and filtration. Um, here, absorption of contaminants to an aluminum or ferric hydroxide precipitate, and then we uh, utilize filtration for the final uh, removal. In other words, you're adding chemicals for particles to flock together, sending them to a uh, sedimentation basin to settle out, and then to a filter, to filter out the remaining. Another option would be lime softening. Um, and that can be widely used, and again, good for arsenic, radium, uranium, and hardness. <coughs> it is pH dependent also, and it requires a high pH, advanced operator skills, because again, now we need to make sure that we're monitoring. Any of these you're going to monitor also. Um, it's not cost effective alternatives for your smaller systems. And you may need to increase alkalinity for corrosion. You don't want to introduce another problem trying to figure out the one, the correct one. So testing may be necessary to make sure the spent media is not hazardous or radioactive with the applying soft. And then reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis can just about handle any cleaning, including all four of the radio nucleus. Reverse osmosis all almost produce a pristine, clear, clean water. Removal of just about any and everything. So if reverse osmosis is so great, what are some of the disadvantages of it? Very costly. Large waste stream. Ah, large waste stream, and they're getting better and better on that. I think now some is down to about only a 20% loss, but it used to be as much as you put in, you're probably coming out with 50% or less. So yeah, that is a, a tremendous thing you know, to be of concern with. And then what do you do with the concentrate problem? Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> I did not hear that. That's a pretty good thing. That's a pretty good thing. And I did not hear that either with all of this concentrated <laughs> arsenic fluoride and microbial oil. You've got nitrogen in the cylinder, dumping 2,100 milligrams per liter of nitrate in a ditch 50 foot from the well every day since I've been here. Probably well, well until two years ago. Well. And then he stopped doing nitrate review and got it in the well. Really? Yeah. Private or public? It's public. Oh, it's a public well? Yeah. And how many times have they been under enforced? Always. <laughs> <laughs> but not by DEDRAC, you know. And we don't regulate what they put in the ground. You know, we don't stop them. Because we know what they were told DEDRAC. We took the samples, took pictures of DEDRAC. Where birds were swimming in it, washing it. Cats and dogs were drinking it. No action ever came. All right. So reverse osmosis is good for arsenic, fluoride, the microbial contaminants, nitrate, radium, uranium, phosphorus, uh, total organic carbon, most metals, sulfate, calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Um, so it covers the gamut of treatment options. Some of the problems, easily filed membranes. Uh, what reverse osmosis is, is, is it's all like a lot of people like to attribute it as a filtration, but now we're using under pressure. Um, your polyamide membrane can easily be damaged by chlorine, high iron, or chloramines. Your cellulose uh, acetate membranes are susceptible to biological fouling, which you're going to use chlorine for. And again, 20 to 40 percent of your raw water loss is in, in the uh, reject stream. And advanced operator skills with fire, but in some cases, reverse osmosis may be your only alternative. I know military use a lot of this. So, some treatment option tips make sure whatever option you deem works well for you that you are doing frequent monitoring. Don't just put something out there and let it go. 
You are in control of your system. You're in control of the quality of the water that you put out. You may have to make some adjustments. And remember, if you do any type of adjustment, changes, or addition, modification to the treatment, you notify who? Super. All right, consider the ease of operations and your operator's qualification. Don't go give an operator something he can't handle uh, and make sure you properly train. Pre-oxidation may be necessary for maximum removal of certain contaminants, uh, contaminants and look at how you have it configured. Um, does it work best if I set it up in series? Redundant seem like that. In series mean this is one, this is right behind it, right behind it. Or do I need parallel configuration for the best removal and to prevent breakthrough? As, as far as series, set up in series, as it goes through one series of uh, filters or what have you, the next filter, you'll have a cleaner product and a cleaner product and a cleaner product. Does that work best with group removal? Or if I set them all up in parallel, you're sort of like equalizing the flow where it's not all of the filters are not going to hit at once with the contaminants. I don't know. You have to do the study and see what works best for you. So testing is the other thing. <coughs> okay. Included in your book also, um, and I'm going to uh, leave it to your leisure, subpart G, uh, which is the identification for be best uh, technology, again, to help you to decide what works best, as well as variances for your small systems, uh, issued only by state exercising the policy. So those are the other remaining topics that are in line with five. Reconnect your leisure. Are there any questions, comments, concerns, or issues? with chemical contaminants. So what do we do when there are chemical contaminants in our water? Treat for it. Okay, you treat for it. What else do we do? You blend. Huh? You blend the water. Okay, blending could be you find some treatment option. It may be an increased frequency that you must adhere to while you're notifying your EPA, state agency, and the public. When there are issues. All right, module seven is the next module that will tackle public notification. Do you think it's a good thing to notify the public when something is wrong with their water? Yeah, yes. Why? They know what they're drinking. Do we want them to know what they're drinking? <coughs> yes. Absolutely. We're the champion of the environment and we have the highest standards. We want to make sure we're putting out a product that is pleasing and also is uh, good for the health, right? Uh, I have a problem with pleasing. <laughs> Why? It's not a regulation of pleasing aesthetics. That's where those secondary standards come in? That's only it's worse than 500 years or more if you had a group of people that don't matter. It's keeping it it yellowy and irony and full of hydrogen sulfides and it's considered the best water of rent. That's what you're going to get. that apartment house. Right. right, and just because I live in a mobile home, I'm not worth the same as someone who lives in a single residence? It depends on if the owner wants to put in treatment and pay for it and all that stuff. All right, King and Richard, we will <laughs> not, you are the champion of the environment. So regardless of where people stay, the quality of the water will be the same, which would be what? The best that we can do. Both on the health risk-wise, as well as the aesthetic. But you want someone giving you a yellow glass of water to drink? Definitely not. <laughs> well, I have to explain to people why they're going to keep drinking their yellow water. That makes it tough. Yeah, and uh, we're also explaining to them that we're doing everything that we can do to rectify the situation if it's a public source, right? Well, if it meets the standards of being rectified. All right. 
So at the end of this chapter, you'll see the need to notify the public. One of the reasons we want the public to make the decision, we want them to have the information where they are making the decision whether or not to drink this yellow glass water that looks like beer. Or <laughs> what's in it? I don't know, but we've done the test, so now we can tell you what's in it. So now you make the decision whether or not you want to utilize that water as your drinking water source, cooking, bathing, the works, or whether or not you want to go to an alternative source such as bottled water that's not heavily that's regulated. Most people do that in the and you know why? Because they can't fix the water they got. No, and sometimes it's just out of ignorance. As uh, Linda pointed out earlier, it's aesthetically pleasing. And so just because it's crystal clear, I believe that that water is better for me. Pointing it out. But do I know that for a fact? Well, I'll tell you that hydrogen sulfide water smells like rotten eggs. Absolutely. It's really good for you. It is really good for you, but it doesn't help people with it. I'm going to try to make sure it's below that threshold. Them, will you tell them to flush that line for about five minutes to get the gas out of the line for the night before? You go back and see how that was working for them? It isn't. Okay, so then I'm out there and I'm flushing to make sure I have freshly chlorinated water in that area no, to have they don't have to rectify it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to look at the regulatory overview of the public uh, notification group. You see what we had to put out with? <laughs> That's why I just have to bow down and keep going. <laughs> oh, as well as um, look at the requirements of the public notification. <clears throat> All right, prior to the Safe Drinking Water Act, the public was not kept informed of what was in their drinking water. It was like, okay, we're doing what we're doing, and we just want you to believe that we have your best interests at heart and that we're treating it the best we can and we're giving you a product that's good for your health. But after the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act, um, language was put into the rules and regs in order to notify the public, to keep them informed, whereas they can make the decision regarding their drinking water. Public notification ensures that customers are always aware of the problems with their drinking water. Sabrina, do you know what's in your water, the contaminants that are in your water? Why not? Do you don't know? Do you receive a CCR every year? I just moved over here. I've never got one. So you haven't been here a full year. But you were a full year wherever you were, right? And, and it was never, within the United States? I've never, ever received a CCR report. I never heard about it until I started working. Really? Do you, did you receive a water bill? Oh, yeah. yeah. Was it probably in the water bill that was possibly tossed? Well, the last place I lived, they um, paid all of that. that okay. Was too, so I've never seen it. Classic case. What do we do with the uh, multi family units where, again, by law, all that is required is to give it to the owner or what have you? You make a good faith effort. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> you get a little pot. <laughs> that means what? I'm going to put extras out there for people to get. You can always go online, and a lot of these systems will even post theirs online, especially the larger systems. Some of the smaller systems, maybe not. But you can pick up the phone call and request. And once you request, by law, they have to give it to you. So you can be aware of what's in your water. The rest of you are familiar with the CCRs, Consumer Confidence Reports? No. No? Oh, <laughs> CCR. You're the one that have to deal with them all the time. That's an <laughs> annual report mandated by EPA that you must yeah. receive by July 1st of each year. And actually, the rule has been in place since 1996. They gave us three years to get on board, so 1999. Probably the first ones. October of 98 was the first one. First so then July 1 of every year thereafter. Okay. Okay. And so, again, remember we talked about those primary standards for surface water being completed every year, for groundwater systems every three years. That's the information that we're going to get in the CCR. 
In addition to that, those monthly VAT keys, if there were any exceedance, that information, the lab to call the result, that information, all of that is in that CCR. And other special languages. So now you are aware that there are issues with your drinking water where you can ask the questions that need to be asked, especially if you're in a situation where you have a compromised immune system. All right, so public notification provides consumers with problems with their drinking water that pose a health risk. Uh, the system's failure to comply with the standards, in other words, we have to tell them ourselves. When we fail to collect samples, we don't get it right, we don't do what the state agency tell us to do as far as a variance or an exemption. All of that must be a part of that CCR. Failure to test the water. In other words, I'm supposed to pull 15 samples, I pull 13. That's a problem. Now let the public know that. Any granted uh, variance, uh, remember that's the less costly technology instead of an RO, they may allow me just to chlorinate. Or exemptions, and that's just simply more time to comply with the regulations. So instead of uh, it's due three years, they may give me six years. Bottom line is I still have to comply. Now this uh, public regulate uh, notification rule was revised in 2000 to include additional language to the customer. Um, now we need to make sure that we're giving them a description of the violation. Uh, what was the contaminant? What were the levels? What's the maximum contaminant level? What's the goal? All of that information. The date of the violation. When did it occur? Potential adverse health effects from the violations. Uh, that language must be very specific. And again, you can refer back to 40 CFR 141, <coughs> 205 for that. And then you want to make sure that you're letting them know which population you present risk. Is it the very old, the young, the compromised immune system individuals? If there is an alternative water supply, again, that's information that needs to be passed along to the customer. What actions should they take if they need to seek medical help? Actions to correct the violation. When do you expect to be back on track? All of that is information public informed of, and then give them a name, business address, phone number of the water system. On this name here, instead of saying, I'm going to put Kevin's name down, how about put his position? And that way, if Kevin decides to make a lateral move, we're not, we got the right person, a position or a title. Someone who knows something, though, and not, let's say, Joe Blow that uh, is out in the field 90% of the time. We want to make sure we're giving, making a good faith effort uh, to give the public good information where they can conversate and get the answers to you. And if you don't know the answer, it's okay. We'll get back with you. Check the EPA uh, guideline. Here's their hotline, but give them some type of Okay, and then you want to make sure that uh, you're asking them to help spread the word uh, to all those remote places where third and fourth cousins are and they very seldom come into town or what have you, but still may be affected. All right, we can do it by posting signs, notices. Those are all okay. Now, as far as the time frame for notifying the public, uh, if it's an acute risk, you got 24 hours to get the word out. Acute risk. What constitutes an acute risk? E. coli. E. coli. The one that. Yeah. E. coli. Um, why? Because if you make you very sick quickly, it causes death. Really? Yes. And that's interesting. So you're telling me that E. coli causes a disease every time it's present in water? I know. No. It has very potential. Good. It has a so potential. It has a very potential. good. Let's color our world here. Okay. Um, when you mention <coughs> E. coli, coliform group 
through the indicative organisms we use in order to detect if pathogenic organisms are present in our water? Is it feasible to test for every single microbial contaminant that's there or pathogen? No, man, how deep are your pockets? You can't do that. So we use the indicative uh, group, which are the coliform group. We have the total coliform, non-fecal, naturally occurring, probably got them on my skin right now, because they're in the air, they're in the soil, they're in the naturally. And then I have the fecal or fecal component of that group. Now with the fecal component, I know that what's in the water, intestinal waste. And if I want to be very specific, test for E. coli, now I know there's human intestinal waste. Now just because human intestinal waste is in that water sample doesn't mean that a disease is present. Know that there's a risk. Birds of a feather clock together. So generally E. coli does not cause death, does not cause disease, but it's what else is in there when they are present that we're most concerned. Is there E. coli in animal waste? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Warm blooded organisms. Put it like that. But E. coli could cause that. Yes, it could. And it has. There have been documented cases in the past. If you go back many years, Jack in the Box, I want to say about 12 years ago, four people died, and it was an E. coli strain that killed them. And if you look at the people who died, who can tell me what their age was? Yeah, and there was a four-year-old girl in the elderly. So again, can it cause disease? Yes. But generally, we say there is a risk of you know, what it is. That's there. So excellent. Whenever there's a combination or E. coli or fecal coliform is present, it's an acute risk. It's time to go into high field with the notification. Now, the system must consult with the state or EPA within 24 hours of a tier one violation. E. coli, fecal coliform, that's the tier one. 24 hours, well really you're supposed to notify them as soon as you get word, or by the next business day, which is at 24 hours, and then you notify the public within 24 hours after confirmed tests. For tier twos, and just like with the uh, lead and copper sampling, there were three tiers. With this right here, there are also three tiers. Uh, that we're looking, they love the tier one, tier two, and tier three. For the tier twos, I have 30 days to notify the public. So what will constitute, yes sir. Hey. Just to note, in Delaware we're a little more stringent, stringent? than the EPA. Okay. We have a 14 day notice for tier two and 90 days for tier three. Oh wow, you all really love your consumers. Well, I, I could never see using a CCR for issuing a public notice that was i i proposed 30 days but our water systems got to the legislature and they made it 90. 90. Okay. 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 yes sir. when we get that first hit of eco uh, should we respond to the first hit or do we have to wait to go get and get repeat wait till the confirmation after the repeat yes so even though we're in panic mode already and the repeats are going to take 48 hours. Even no, it should probably take about 24. Yeah. You got to collect and collect within 24. But by the time they test those, you're going to be two or three days still down the road. Yeah. If they come up clean, why did you panic everybody? If I had one, I doubt it comes up. Because, <laughs> well, I don't know. Because we've had situations where the first one is dirty and then the rest of them are okay. And then we go back pleading to the state and validate this because this is not representative because our operator stuck his finger in. So That's you won't always anyway. confirm, huh? That's false anyway. You know, the presumption that putting your finger in the words when they call it, they actually determine all um, sampler errors actually less probably than people think. That people think, but that is still one of the... Yeah. <coughs> it's very, it's less mm -hmm. than 5% chance of it actually very renewed that sample here is your actual problem. It's more that the sink itself is going to cause your problem. It could be a screen on the sink or something that, but yeah, sample error is very, very, very small change that actually causes your problem. Let me ask you a question. When you get the uh, responses like that, the letters, do you all investigate whether or not this is true what they're saying or how do you handle this? You mean what the worst system tell us? 
Yeah, when the system says, hey, operator error, we'll be involved, validate this. We do majority of the sampling for the state. We oh. got one of the few systems, few states that do it, so we done that. And the yeah. only way we would validate a sample is if they do get a confirmation sample and the same site comes back positive, and only that site comes back positive, then we will validate. You will not validate off of one sample. Okay, so there you go. Plus and we you know are our responsible for most of the sample. Yeah, but That's there are larger system. systems to do it too. We know which operators can we can trust and which ones we might want to say. That's just one yeah. operation. <laughs> and see in Texas, and the always operators, has to get confirmation. Really, <laughs> in Texas, operators collect most of the samples. Right. And in Texas, as I told you all earlier, I was dual certified. Uh, if you work for a private company, you're probably working wastewater and water at the same time. And we do have an instance where legitimately so operator here is right. out there working at the wastewater plant. Now every back team that he collected, and that's how we know it's an operator issue. Everyone he collected that day comes back positive. What's wrong? Like we're talking about the system. Something wrong with the lab. <laughs> 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 Okay, new point, moving right along. 
Turbidity greater than 5 10, 10, uh, NTUs and F roll uh, turbidity units, that's an acute. And you would say, wow, people actually have that in their finished water. True, true, they do. Because sometimes I knew one system uh, leaving the plant, it was uh, less than the point three. But because of the pipes, by the time it got to some of the consumer homes, we're looking at a 40 and 60 into use. Uh, treatment technique exceedance with uh, your privacy agency uh, determines to be so. In other words, they can look at what you're doing and say, hey, this falls under tier one instead of tier two or tier three. They have that authority. Any occurrence of waterborne disease or when you have any of these in your groundwater source, E. coli, enterococcus, or coliphage, or other violation with significant adverse health effects, all of that will fall under the tier ones. And with the tier ones, we're notifying the public within 24 hours, super. Um, you can use the media, radio, television, newspapers. You can post it in public areas, but make sure it's in an area where people see it. That's in addition to the other notification. I can't just say, hey, I'm going out there and posting it at the, what's an area no one ever utilizes here, they'll be, no one ever goes. The pumping station. Absolutely. I can post it there and say, hey, I've done due diligence. Okay. And deliver it to customers. So it has to be posted in a place that's frequented by people. Tier twos, notification, any MCL and RDLs or treatment techniques that are not covered under tier ones will fall here. Uh, violation of the privacy, any violation the privacy agents determines. In other words, again, they're given that authority. Or failure to comply with the terms of a variance or an exemption. They give you an exemption, extra time to get it done, and you still don't get it done. But now you have to come back and tell the public, hey, I didn't do what my privacy agent told me to do. And in your case, you're going to have to for 14 days. Um, your groundwater, if it fails to maintain the four law, four law treatment for viruses, uh, inactivation of viruses uh, for more than four hours, or any corrective action within the state plan uh, or within their time frame, that's another tier two violations, or repeated failure to conduct monitoring for triplets for it. That's a tier two. And again, some of the same ways that we talked about with the tier ones is we're going to employ for notifying the public, use of the media, <coughs> and delivery, or any other additional methods. Uh, for non-community system, posting it in a public area, posting it in a public area, or mailing. And a situation like this, the mailing may not get to every individual, because what were the non-community systems? Daycare, school, gas station, rest stop. <laughs> huh? I said, <clears throat> it could be the same or not the same people, but they, they don't live there and they just transit through. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It has to be at least 25 yeah. of the same individuals, but you're right. What about daycare? They could have 30 kids every day. That's what right, and so the owner may get it, <laughs> and hopefully they're posting it all of the mothers and fathers that come in their kids are seeing. In Delaware, we added a requirement for daycares and schools. It has to be sent home to the parent or guardian. Yeah, we had one good division director. Delaware. We had a good division director that was really into public notification. Don't go south of Georgetown. <laughs> it's a lot different there. Yeah. All right, tier three notification. Yeah. Any monitoring violations, failure to comply with the established testing procedure, and I think we've already established anything uh, that you must report must be an approved method. Availability of unregulated contaminant monitoring results, uh, if that is a requirement, you're supposed to be monitoring something that's not on that regulated list, you gotta do it. 
can't say, well, it's not on the list. You've got to do it. And you've got to keep the results, too. Uh, exceedance of a secondary maximum contaminant level for community systems, and that's for fluoride only. So in this case, the uh, secondary does matter. Okay. Not a violation, but hey. Same method of delivery uh, as with the tier two. So, are there any questions? Bottom line, at the end of the day, we want to make sure the product that we're producing is good for that good case. But not necessarily pleasing. And pleasing. <laughs> That's the goal, Danny. The goal. <laughs> Keep your eye on the goal. The goal, huh? <laughs> and, uh, other questions, comments, concerns, or issues on public notification? Just one yes, note in Delaware, fluoride, your last slide, mm -hmm. we made two our primary. MCI. Two is your primary, and yeah. I think, Anita, you pointed that out earlier. Yeah, it makes right. it a lot easier than dealing with a primary and secondary for the same contaminant. Yeah. didn't make much sense. There again, there's that love. <laughs> there's that love. Well, we all drink the water in Delaware, so we want to make sure it's safe. And, and that's an excellent point, true story. <laughs> there was a city in California, and it was the actual uh, department where they were treating the water and all of that. Over a million dollars in bottled water costs. <laughs> they weren't drinking their own water. They were not <laughs> drinking their own water. <laughs> that tells so. you about their water, don't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah,